uh, happy to see you all at uh, this uh, bi-weekly meeting of the seminar series of 19th century Russian culture. Before introducing our speakers, uh, I would just like to make a couple announcements and uh, uh, say a couple of words of thanks uh, to the Jordan Center for hosting this event and the 19th century V uh, and 19th V platform more generally, to Josh Tucker, the director of the center for his help facilitating the project, and of course to Sasha Spitalnik, without whose angelic patience and uh, generous help this uh, uh, would not be possible. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, our uh, series organizer, Sarah, Sarah Dickinson, uh, who has done so much work uh, bringing this all together and is still doing so much work uh, uh, making this possible. So a couple of announcements. Our next uh, talk will take place on July 15th uh, at the same time, and the speaker will be Vadim Schneider, uh, whose talk is entitled The Mowing Scene in Anna Karenina and the Poetics of Labor at the Dawn of Russian uh, Age of Capital. And uh, our discussant, or as we call it, um, Sebisednik, which is a slightly different format, uh, a, a briefer format, um, uh, is uh, going to be Yanni uh, uh, uh the historian from NYU. I would also like to mention that we are about to uh, have a landing page on the Jordan Center uh, website, uh, especially dedicated to the group and to the project. And uh, um, on the landing page, um, uh, there will be a Google Doc. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with it. Uh, hopefully all of you have uh, already signed up. Um, if you have not heard of the famous Google Doc, please contact one of us um, 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 uh, and we will, we will uh, send you a link. Finally, uh, just to say that uh, we're all very happy to have such a, um, you know, due to, to the difficult times, such a uh, international group here and uh, uh, really hope and, and welcome um, comments, questions in Russian. Uh, so our speaker today is uh, the art historian Alison Lee uh, from uh, University of Louisiana at Lafayette, whose talk's title is Alexander Ivanov, um, Painting, Desire, and the 19th Century Male Nude. Uh, and uh, uh, after the uh, Alison's talk, we will have um, a brief intervention from uh, the art historian, the art and literary historian uh, Molly Brunson of Yale University, and then move on to our usual question and answer comment format moderated by Sasha. Uh, for a few housekeeping points, I will now yield to Sasha, and then we will uh, go on with the talk. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to give you all our little housekeeping spiel before we get started. Um, I'm going to mute everyone now. And if you could all please keep yourselves muted for the duration of the talk, that would be much appreciated. And if you could also open up your chat window and your participants window and update your name to your full name, that would be very helpful. Um, and that's just to facilitate our Q&A, which is going to happen after the lecture, as we already said. Um, I'm going to partially disable chat for the duration of the lecture portion of today's event. So if you're having any technical difficulties, um, chat with host will be turned on so you can send me a message. And if need be, I can let Allison know. We'll stop the presentation and we'll make sure that the problem is solved before we get going. Um, once we begin the Q&A, I'll enable chat with everyone. Um, and rather than using the raise your hand feature, we're asking everyone to just send a message uh, if you'd like to speak. So just give us a heads up, say, I would like to speak. You know, it's a very simple message and um, I will add you to the list, uh, to the queue. Um, also just wanted to give a quick uh, pitch uh, for another event that the Jordan Center has coming up next week. Um, it's part of our New York Russia public policy seminar that we run in conjunction with the Harriman Institute at uh, Columbia University. It's called Russian Civil Society in the Time of COVID-19. Um, and we've got a really interesting set of panelists coming to speak, um, academics as well as practitioners and people based uh, in 
in, in Russia uh, currently. So I'm sending the link to that event um, in the chat and hope to see many of you there. And uh, yeah, you can get started. So Allison or whoever is next, <laughs> if you wanna take it away. All right, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, I see. Okay, I see heads shaking. Um, I just I just want to briefly say thank you before I start sharing the screen and kind of launch into things. I see so many faces, former students, family, friends, uh, uh, people who I, whose work I respect and I dream of meeting someday here. So thank you so much, everybody, for taking time out uh, to hear about my book and to hear some of this research on Ivanov. I'm really, really excited to share this. Uh, I have not put it out into the world a great deal, um, but as, you, as you'll see, the book is coming out soon, so it, it feels like time. So uh, thank you to Molly for, for being the Subisiednik discussant here, to Anne for getting this uh, 19th century uh, group off the ground, to Sasha for doing the organizing, Ilya for uh, introducing everybody. I just, um, uh, thank yous across the board. All right, let me share the screen and see if we are in business. Sasha, you're going to say, what did you do? Because I changed something slightly. Um, when I do this, is the PowerPoint huge or small for, for everybody? Sasha, maybe you can say. I, re um, I minimized it a bit for myself. Did it get smaller than it was before? It does look smaller than it was okay. before. Then let me put it like, back like it was. It, um, I'll just say to everybody and my students who are here, if any are here, will know that I'm, I'm doing this two monitor thing that I do that when I was teaching that made it a bit easier, but it means when you see me looking over here, I'm looking at the PowerPoint because I have it on, on another screen. So sorry if that's a little awkward. Is it huge now for everybody? Yeah, it's the it's okay. full screen. All right, then let's let's leave it like that. Um, so let me let me just dive right in. This is the the cover of the book. Many of you saw it in the in the advertisement. I can officially say, as of yesterday, I heard from my editor it will be out October first. Uh, if you order for some reason the uh, Kindle or e version of it, you'll get it actually a month earlier. They're saying September first for it now, so uh, it's coming fast. Uh, and here is what the the cover of it now looks like. Um, I don't want to spend too long. I'm gonna look at the time. Twelve eleven. Uh, my time kind of going through what what comprises the book the overall kind of scope of it i'm showing everyone now the the table of contents so that you can kind of peek at, at the direction or the overall flow of how it goes but um i'll just say this is a project as you can tell from the title of the book picturing russia's men um that had me thinking through uh, in what ways can painting specifically or art more generally uh tell us something that we perhaps can't figure out from any other source or find out from literature uh, and poetry and, and other cultural uh, elements in different ways, what can painting specifically tell us about gendered life and about men's lives specifically in this period in the 19th century. Um, so I proceed, I think, as you can see from the, the table of contents uh, in a kind of case study fashion, each one, each chapter of the six total, including the, or in addition, uh, the introduction, grapples with some individual artist and his painting practice, um, or as in the case of the introduction, uh, kind of sets the scene for what kinds of picturing of men have happened uh, both by Russian artists themselves, or in this case, many of you know, George Dawes' uh, 332 total portraits, which he did with two uh, very important Russian assistants uh, that now comprise what's known as the military gallery uh, in the Winter Palace, also uh, in the Hermitage Museum now in St. Petersburg. So I think many people in the, in the Zoom room have been in this space. Uh, many of you I know have not. Um, it's one to put on the bucket list if you've, never, if you've never seen it. But this was a real originary kind of space for me in terms of thinking of this project back when this was still just a dissertation. I just, I loved being in this space surrounded, as you can see, by all of these portraits. Um, but it made me think a lot about what does this kind of tradition traditional look at, at uh, men in terms of history painting or history, historical portraiture, what does this suppress about men's actual lives? Because this puts only their public achievements on view, only the sensibility of men in terms of uh, the things they do in warfare or the things they achieve on behalf of the, the nation, the state, the government, what does this not tell us? Um, so that's where I think the individual case studies of each chapter uh, are hopefully very illuminating. The first chapter is on Karl Bulov. Uh, some of you may have heard me give a talk recently uh, at ACES this past year, uh, where I essentially grapple with his self-portraiture practice from the very beginning of his life uh, with this uh, little 
unusual drawing that doesn't get talked about very often from when he was a student at the academy, all the way to the very end of his life uh, with these uh, kind of intense portraits, self-portraits that he makes, and little inclusions of himself in monumental canvases, many of you know, uh, this very famous The Last Day of Pompeii. So I move then to the works of Pavel Fedotsov, another artist that some of you, many of you may be familiar with, uh, but instead of looking at his more canonical works, ISS, um, his kind of grappling with different versions of his masculine identity as a soldier or as a, an officer originally, but then as he transitions after 1844 to retirement um, and uh, the kinds of watercolors and drawings and, and oils, in, in particular the gamblers there at the top. Um, and how that too tells us something about men either achieving what they were supposed to according to the structures of society or kind of endlessly falling short because of the paradoxical nature uh, of tenets for masculinity in this period. So the chapter that I'm going to excerpt and kind of share with you today, I won't talk much about, it's about Alexander Ivanov and his sexuality, as, as we'll see. Um, beyond this, I move kind of in the same central section of the book into thinking not so much about homoeroticism or homosexuality, but about homosociality in the 19th century, about groups, artist groups, and this artel of artists from the 1860s um, is the, the, the kind of case study I focus on. Though I move, I hope, in a direction that many don't in thinking about the artel, which is into some of these really magical portraits using the medium known as sauce. Um, that Kramskoy and uh, Nikolai Dmitry of Orenburgsky both grapple with as their members of the Artel and how this kind of uh, bonds of men reinforces an ideology about brotherhoods and things that, that is comparable to Western Europe. Sorry about my cat, she's decided to uh, participate in the, in the lecture today. Uh, maybe she'll settle down soon. So from there, again, just very briefly, I move into a, a case study on Kromskoy. He figures very largely in the chapter on the Artel since he basically heads up the Artel. Uh, but this is the chapter really devoted to uh, more kind of gender parity may, than maybe the others in terms of looking at how men envision women and how women reinforce men's identities. This is very important for Kremskoy. I kind of discover that he's something of an unusual case because he very much identifies with the women in his life, whether that's his wife here on the left, his daughter, his daughter again, or uh, some of the more famous canonical, you know, big uh, Russian paintings that many, many authors have, have grappled with, like this uh, Nyiz Vyesnaya, the, the unknown woman, uh, again from the, the early 1880s. The final chapter moves back to thinking about men and is a case study on Repin, uh, probably the most famous of all of these 19th century painters. Um, and I do work on some of his most famous paintings, including uh, this one, which is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. So one of the few uh, that, that is on American soil. Uh, I see Elizabeth Balkanier is here today. She's written a great deal, very brilliantly on this painting. So that was a, a huge coup for me to start with that. But to think about how these paintings are essentially paintings of broken men, of wounded men, of vulnerable men. And now that is showing a breakdown at the, towards the end of the century uh, in terms of these very uh, earlier, somewhat some more stable structures where men were seen as invulnerable and powerful and not subject to the kind of breakdown from alcoholism and depression that we begin to get after the Tsar's assassination in 1881. So that's the kind of a quick, quick spiel, grand, grand scope. Hopefully I've, I've whet your appetite to want to dig into some of these chapters. Um, it is available for pre-order now. I, I won't do this too much. I gotta sort of say, shamelessly self-promote, but I did manage to grapple from my editor a discount code, pretty good one, 35% here. She wasn't able to tell me how long it'll be good for, but if anyone has a little extra money in their research budget this year or uh, wants to treat themselves to an early Christmas present or something, the book is available. And uh, of course, I'd be, be thrilled uh, to see it starting to sell. So I leave, that, I leave that to you, but it is up on Bloomsbury's website. So that's step aside. How do you do on time? All right, less than 10 minutes. Perfect. Um, I, I want to just kind of launch into this, this excerpt from chapter three, the one that I didn't really say a whole lot about. Um, and, and I'm going to do it in the very traditional traditional art historical style, which means I've prepared a talk and uh, don't really trust myself to speak extemporaneously and get to absolutely everything I wanted to. So I'll try to make it as lively as I possibly can. Please feel free to start putting questions in the chat as they arise. I'm excited most about that portion. And I've tried to keep the talk to about 25 minutes, so not super long, so that we have a lot of time for discussion and questions if there are some. So 
Okay, everything good technically? I don't need to, uh, audio's been good, screen is good, thank you. Everything's great. Thank you. So in the summer of 1831, the Russian painter Alexander Ivanov began this painting in Rome, where he had been sent to study, like several others in the period, by the Society for the Encouragement of Artists, which was based in Moscow. Ivanov had trained at the Imperial Academy of Arts in St. Petersburg, and this painting was the first, the very first, independent work that he began once he was in the Italian capital. It is a canvas saturated with the ideals of antiquity, which the young artist had been exposed to via that formal training. But it is also an artwork that subtly exceeds the calm propriety of that established classical style. In it, Apollo, pictured there in the center, is shown with his two young lovers as they bask in a kind of perpetual summer. On the right, Cyprus rests there against the god's torso, ensconced kind of contentedly in the space under his arm, while Hyacinthus, on the left side, plays a pipe, looking up at Apollo to gauge his approval, I think. In response, the glowing god there in the center reaches tenderly, and I'll show you a detail, for the boy's right knee. And in person, and from this real tight picture, you can see his middle finger just grazes, just presses into the youth's pristine skin. All three of the figures, in fact, uh, are connected in this way through similar kinds of touch in the painting. Touch binds them and markers of arousal in response to that touch are unambiguously kind of scattered throughout the painting. It's there, I believe, in the hanging swag of fabric between Apollo's legs. It's there in Hyacinthus's quite phallic pipe in Cyprus's open mouth. The style of the painting and the story itself were not uncommon for the time, but the intensity with which the artist is conveying all this eroticism was, as I will argue, unusual in this era. So the excerpt from my book that I want to share with you, and I begin sort of showing you what the direction I'm going to go, is going to continue in this way by examining Ivanov's artistic production from the first half of the 19th century to explore the place of homoerotic content like this in various Russian permutations of neoclassicism. Ivanov's work and the many facets of same-sex desire contained within it counter history's supreme focus on heteronormative masculinity and help us better understand the multifarious ways men, oh, I lost my place, sorry, the men's erotic proclivities were implicated in the constitution of their masculinity. Unfortunately, scholars in numerous fields have often shied away from such investigations, often considering intimate realms inappropriate for this kind of intellectual assessment. In fact, while several scholars have pointed out the unusual nature of Ivanov's work, it's actually quite common for scholars, including Soviet scholars, to point out that it, this is all very unusual. Um, few have actually gone the further distance of interpreting his paintings in terms specifically of his sexuality. In fact, only Rosalind Blakesley, and I'm not sure if she's here today, I know she was going to try to make it, she was the one who really began opening the door to this kind of work nearly two decades ago by highlighting the enormous implications that such research on Ivanov's sexuality could have for developing our broader comprehension of Russian society. I would argue that such work also creates a fuller picture of the continuum, uh, continuum of masculinities, which I was trying to kind of begin giving you just a little bit of, of a sense of when I was describing briefly the contents of my book in terms of the amount of, of different artists' work that I cover in it. So, general introductory stuff aside, I want to begin properly now by describing where the Apollo painting came from in Ivanov's imaginary. From letters, it becomes clear that he began sketching for this work almost immediately upon arriving in Rome in the spring of 1831. 
an early sketch from that year shows one of his initial conceptions. In it, as you can see, he figured Apollo more in a moment of musical instruction, and the sketch reveals much about the artist's training at the Academy in Petersburg, where he had begun studying at the tender age of just 11, which wasn't that uncommon, in 1817. Figure studies from his time at the Academy, which are known as Académie drawings, um, well, which he made while he was a student there, frequently position the body in a somewhat similar way to Apollo in this early sketch. You can see this one foot propped up slightly to vary the position of the legs and sort of reorient the hips in space was something that was common in Académie drawings as well. So all of this shows a budding artist who is learning to grapple uh, or learning the nuances of the body's musculature, for sure. Ivanov demonstrates a particular interest in the subtle connections between uh, various muscle groups, the way, for instance, that the deltoid slides into the bulge of a bicep or the connection between the different extensors around the elbow. While such attention to musculature was not uncommon among artists at the time, in fact, it was encouraged, the level of connection Ivanov demonstrated with many of these anonymous sitters was unusual. Several of Ivanov's Academy drawings, in fact, show the figure gazing directly down at him as though, and this couldn't have been true, but as though the model and the artist were maintaining eye contact for the entire duration of what were quite long sessions. Ivanov would frequently also offset the contours of his male figures with these hatched lines um, that flow parallel with the bodies. And as you can see, though I know the detail isn't great, and it might be even further pixelated over Zoom, uh, but I think hopefully you can see a little bit that sometimes he's even rubbing the marks to soften right around the contour of the body as the session is continuing to progress. So Ivanov also paid close attention specifically, as he was supposed to, but to the shaded region of his male model's bodies. Note, for instance, in this one, the deep shadow on the inside of the upper right thigh uh, in this drawing and the way it pulls your eye to this zone, much like the shaded areas behind and around Apollo's legs in the early painting sketch I was showing you before. All of these drawings demonstrate a gratification in the act of looking and a kind of fondness for every detail of the masculine physique. They reveal something of the artist's own inner thoughts as he sought to create a psychic space for his sexuality in an environment which we know was one of extreme traditionalism and scrutiny in this first half of the century. For within the staunchly patriarchal society that Tsar Nicholas I mandated, it became increasingly problematic to subvert dominant gender paradigms. While Ivanov's subtle marking of the male body as an erotic object was certainly dangerous, he obviously found ways to bind male figures subtly through gestures and gazes, and this would all prove important for the Apollo painting to come once he gets to Rome. In many ways, this, and I'm now showing you the more developed oil study for the painting, this oil study shows the fruits, I think, of these labors. Cyprus has now come to be nuzzled under Apollo's arm, while the god now is reaching for uh, Hyacinthus's knee. Much now appears as it will in the final painting here. The two large boulders have been arranged, the draperies have been loosely mapped out, and the skin tones have been tested out. One of the only significant changes still to come, though, was in Hyacinthus's relation to the playing of the pipe, and some of you may have already noticed this. In the 1831 oil study, the boy is not yet actively playing the instrument. Instead, as you can see, he holds it out in front of his mouth. Drawings from the time certainly show Ivanov testing out various configurations for this figure. Sometimes he's wearing sandals, uh, other times not. Sometimes he has really firmly delineated biceps and abdominals, but then at other times uh, they've been reduced down to create this more sinewy young body. 
the figure will become even younger in that final canvas. And the hyacinth is found there is shorter, obviously so, his belly rounder. He's not yet developed muscles like those Ivanov's model obviously possessed. Instead, he is all glowing childishness, his fingers moving up and down the pipe to please his companions. That object also underwent a number of alterations. In several drawings, the mouthpiece of the instrument is almost obscenely penile, and Ivanov seems to have become increasingly preoccupied with rendering the instrument's tip as it broached Hyacinthus's pursed lips. Some of the changes occurring in the handling of this figure may just reflect Ivanov's practice of using female models for male figures. One study for the figure of Cyprus, which I'm showing you now, shows three different versions of the model, very popular model at the time, Vittoria Caldoni. On the far left, as you can see, she is shown with her hair parted in the middle. In the center, she's morphed into this more androgynous figure with very wide set eyes, now more darkened eyebrows, and a fuller mouth. On the right, she's become a hybrid of the two previous sketches. The chiseled short curls have been maintained from the center figure, as have these large eyes and the elongated nose, but now the mouth has been opened and the head tipped backward. This figure will be transposed almost exactly into the final painting. Later oil sketches show Ivanov continuing this practice, often superimposing or mixing the heads of female models with boys' bodies. The study I'm showing you on the right now contains a further two variants of the same model. The mixed gender figure on the left has a male pectoral region, but then a really distinctively female face, while the figure on the right, or the version on the right maybe I should say, has had their features masculinized across the entirety of the form. Shortened hair, lower jawline, thinner lips, tauter belly, so on and so forth. All of these composites imply that the features of masculinity glide on the surface of the body, that they can be emphasized or de-emphasized. They are constructed as opposed to being innate. The studies also imply that sexuality and its investment in real bodies is mobile, existing in a state of flux that goes against heteronormative assumptions about male desire. In this sense, they infer a profoundly modern conception of gender and sexuality, one that sees bodies as performing alternatively male or female roles. Now, before I get much further into this, especially for the art historians who are, who are watching, I know I have to note that there was most definitely a classical context for the kind of gender liminality found in Ivanov's depictions, i.e. he's not alone in doing this. By the 1830s, representations of the ephebic male body had been fully assimilated into a range of depictions by European artists. Jacques-Louis David's The Death of Joseph Barra, which I'm showing you here, provides a great example of this kind of feminized male youthful body. Ivanov's ephebic boys participate in a similar kind of libidinal economy. But, and this is a big but, the figuring of Hyacinthus as a prepubescent child was really unusual. Recent French paintings of that figure coupled with Apollo habitually depict him as an older boy. And the same was usually true of depictions of Cyprus. Ivanov departed deeply from the typical age gap between these protagonists, and he unabashedly focused on the period of sensual reverie before as you can see, before the figure's deaths, which is the moment that is usually uh, especially being depicted by the French. It was perhaps these deviations that led to some reproaches concerning the painting. A letter Ivanov wrote in August of 1831 described the feedback he received from Vincenzo Camuccini, an official appointed by the Russian government to mentor pensioners in Rome. And here's the quote from the letter. Quote, Camuccini began with fervor to assert that I have little understanding of the sublime style. He hardly sees it in the figure of Cyprus. He says that it is necessary for young people to think about sublime beauty such that they might discern the truly exquisite from the ordinary, end quote. 
Tamuchini's comments did affect him. They led him to attempt a numerous alterations to both figures. Hyacinthus's back, as you can see from these photos I took at the Trechikov, was moved forward. You see this kind of haze around the backside, um, bringing him closer to Apollo and forcing the artist actually to retrace the entire line of that vertebral column. Ivanov also altered the angle of the pipe uh, a lot, as you can see. The hazy pipes around the base, as well as across the top and bottom, again, show his peculiar difficulty with this specific object. He seems to have obsessed over the shape and its relation to the boy's mouth, in the process creating a blurred halo, which serves as a lasting sign of his fetishization of this figure. Ivanov also adjusted the position of Cyprus. It's a little bit less visible, uh, likely in response to Camuccini's further comment that, quote, this is nature, but ugly nature, end quote. The Italian word he used there, brutta, has a connotation of dirtiness, as if the artist had soiled the body's natural beauty by handling it with such vivid realism. Essentially, Ivanov's figures were derived too much from the carnal earthly realm. They were, as Camuccini had described them, too much from the realm of, quote, the ordinary. Hyacinthus and Cyprus were indeed models from the real world and not just some artificial studio fiction. Their transference from this context, however, had robbed them of the idealized model of masculinity that saw ephebic young men as the apogee of beauty. They no longer conformed to the collective symbolic order. Instead, they revealed a masculinity not in control of itself, one that was divulging too much of Ivanov's own erotic investments and therefore violating the norms for how classical depiction was supposed to function. It's worth mentioning too that Ivanov's own father expressed concerns about the content of his son's paintings in the same year that he was working on the Apollo. I'd like to share a good portion of a letter from Andre, Ivanov's father, which was sent to his son, and I think we'll show you a little bit here what I mean. Quote, I had the pleasure of reading and admiring your last report to the Society for the Encouragement of Artists. Continue to study such forms and remember that these will attest to your moral aspect and to the shape of your thoughts. The present circumstances in Europe demand special discretion with which a young man has to carry himself so that you do not fall into any kind of temptation or join up with a naughty lot. I do not expect this of you because of your discretion. Nevertheless, I did not consider it useless to warn you, dear Alexander, when you decide to work on something seriously, choose some ordinary theme and go with God. Try not to reach for subjects that are morally depraved." End quote. Scholars have generally, as you can imagine, believed that Ivanov's father was warning his son not to get embroiled in the revolution that had begun in Paris in 1830. Yet Andre's words potentially have meaning beyond the concern that his son might fall in with the wrong political crowd. His reference to, quote, the present circumstances in Europe may actually be a veiled allusion to the licentiousness that so characterized Rome. For in the period Ivanov lived there, the Italian capital was known as one of the most permissive European cities due to the unparalleled level of sexual freedom this city fostered. And I see Roman, maybe Roman can say a little bit more about this uh, because I know it's right up his alley. Sorry to call out people, I can still see all your little faces. All right. Um, let, me, let me keep going. Um, it's worth noting, yeah, that Andre had also taken an active interest specifically in the Apollo canvas uh, when his, his son first mentioned or informed him about that project. He asked Alexander to promptly send him a drawing of the picture, and when he saw it, he recommended changes to it, which I should point out Alexander did not actually do. Thus, his concern that his son not choose a, quote, morally depraved subject, and this counsel's proximity to his fear that Alexander might fall victim to temptation, indicate that his apprehensions may have gone beyond the political. 
Furthermore, the artist himself was increasingly concerned with his ability to control uh, amidst the lust and vices, which were, in his words, stifling mankind. In a journal that he kept in the 1840s, a page of which uh, I'm showing you now, the artist alluded to himself as a, quote, reprobate, and he prayed intensely for God's help in keeping him from what he described as, quote, thousands of temptations. I'll share just one entry, which serves, I think, as a typical example of the kind of self-chastisement that he was then producing. Quote, O oh Lord, give me strength to read your revelations so that I can cope with finishing my current work. I'll be humble and correct my deformities as much as my reason allows. Italy itself may have been a difficult location to embrace such abstinence and to focus on work, but it was not the only country where the deformities Ivanov described were present. According to accounts by foreign observers, sodomy had been practiced in Eastern Europe since well before the time of Peter the Great. And while data on homosexual activity in Russia is rather scant in the first half of the 19th century, sources do attest to a queer subculture in major cities as early as the 1830s. In fact, it was in this very decade that Nevsky Prospect, the main thoroughfare in St. Petersburg, became heavily associated with what was called pederastic depravity, giving rise to what the historian Dan Healy has referred to as, quote, codes of mutual recognition. These gestures and phrases, which of course we still have today, served to signal homoerotic interest and were the principal trope of identification among homosexual groups who utilize signs such as the significant glance as a form of discrete self-proclamation. Keep this in mind while you consider this self-portrait that Ivanov made, which is striking for the glance it contains. It was produced in 1828 when he was still living in St. Petersburg, i.e. where Nevsky Prospect is coming to be associated with this kind of activity. In it, he looks penetratingly out from the portrait and his arresting gaze is reinforced by the coquettish angle of his head, a detail which adds an erotic charge to the portrait. This tilt is further emphasized by the large floppy hat he wears, an item of clothing that looks particularly eccentric worn with the austere military uniform he dons as a student of the academy. Out from under the brim of this peculiar sartorial item, Ivanov emphasized his own looking by enlarging that eye nearest to us. He added two slivers of pure white to accentuate the conjunction of light and his eye's wetness, highlighting the connection between what he is seeing and its entering his body through sight. The rest of the self-portrait is all murky, muted tans and umber shades, broken only by the drab navy of his jacket and the blush physicality of his mouth, which helps us to see this long cylindrical object Ivanov holds adroitly between his curled fingers. That object's proximity to his mouth reinforces the conception that it must be a pipe, but it also reads as a mall stick, an object that would make sense given Ivanov's status as an artist. Artist. The ambiguity of the object and its relationship to his mouth foreshadow the difficulties Ivanov would come to have with Hyacinthus and his instrument, moving the pipe, as you remember, away from the boy's mouth and then ultimately into it over the course of his studies. Both paintings problematize the relation between hand and mouth and interceding phallic object. They both also demonstrate Ivanov's inability to ever really reconcile their interaction in paint. For even more so than the unfinished Apollo, the self-portrait remains deeply unresolved. Only the significant glance was fully worked out and it sought to establish homoerotic content uh, contact with the world outside. It perhaps comes as little surprise then that this motif, deeply related as it was to problems which we see surface again in the Apollo painting, would find its way into compositions many years later. 
researchers have noted another self-portrait, which can be found in the appearance of Christ to the people, perhaps Ivanov's most famous work, a painting with which the artist struggled for two decades. The bearded man, which I'm indicating, seated behind John the Baptist, has been identified as a self-portrait, and it has much in common with the artist's depiction of himself from 1828. Again, Ivanov wears an oversized hat. He's clothed in a dark blue garment, and once more he's shown with this phallic object kind of adjacent to his face. Both self-portraits also serve to tie together Ivanov's figurations of himself with the young male models who served him, in particular those who posed for the figure of Hyacinthus. Like that figure, Ivanov in the much later painting is shown in profile, both figures only have the right side of their faces exposed to view, and both are gazing upwards. Both also have much in common with a boy shown similarly in profile in what is presumed to be a study for the appearance of Christ. The boy on the left of this work similarly holds a, a phallic object in his hands, and his fingers are in fact arranged in the same configuration as hyacinthuses. Both are also, again, in close proximity to the figure's mouths. It seems Ivanov's method of constructing figures via the production of composites did not end with the painting of the Greek lovers. The artist and his young male models were drawn together via these figurations to form the ultimate composite, collapsing the space between their bodies to form a hybrid produced out of the pressure of Ivanov's own desire. In the end, these pictures return us to Ivanov's early Academie drawings and the sensitivity with which he recorded those male features and the exchange of gazes that bound the figures together. They also reveal Ivanov's modernity, his innovation in bringing about bodies which are never entirely male or female, but always in a state of amorphous performance, shifting between the binaries. By incorporating himself into the mix as a double for these androgynous boys, Ivanov embraced his own position of liminality, a quality that aligns him with other great modernists in Western Europe who found ways to picture the pathos ridden impossibility of their desire's fulfillment as well. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm up even, uh, I want to sort of just give voice to the fact that everybody's clapping for you, Alice. Oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's I, somehow that is the the sort of oddest part of this genre is that we get silent applause. But um, oh, I see all the, I see all the clapping emojis. Yeah. Now. Thank you. Silent applause, <laughs> silent applause and um, much deserved. Um, I also want to do what I'm sure Allison is unwilling to do, and that is to promote her book one more time and to remind you that it's coming out October 1st and that um, she has graciously offered us all a 35% discount code to pre-order. So uh, the code is GLRTW5. Um, and I'm sure uh, you could also write Allison to get that as well. Um, Absolutely. Thank you, Mo. Okay. You're welcome. So um, I'm going to take my instructions as Sabasiednik uh, quite seriously. And those instructions were to um, not speak as long as a discussant would um, and to attempt uh, to extrapolate out towards broader issues about the 19th century that might um, open a conversation uh, for this, th th this group in an interdisciplinary broad way. Uh, and so in order to do that, I want to address two topics or two sets of questions that really struck me in Allison's talk. Um, and the first one really begins with recognizing Allison's achievement with the lecture she's just given us. Uh, the homoeroticism of Ivanov's Italian studies and the potential homosexuality of the artist himself is, as Allison mentions, almost always mentioned by art historians. Um, indeed, how can it not be after seeing these works that she showed us today. Uh, but really, with the exception of a few, Rosalind Blakesley, for example, whom Allison mentions, it is almost always mentioned only to be immediately put aside. And I really want to emphasize this. You know, everybody mentions it, everybody then immediately moves on. 
Um, it almost always is never lingered upon. The homoeroticism of Ivanov's male nudes has been then something like a strangely open secret. It would be embarrassing not to acknowledge, but it would also be embarrassing to say too much about it. And it's possible that some of this collective scholarly modesty is a result of the seemingly very young age of many of Ivanov's male models. So there's a hint of something untoward, maybe even immoral, in this adult artist gaze at an erotic boy body. Now, the result of this tacit agreement to never speak too much about Ivanov's homoeroticism is that it's often prevented opportunities for sustained analytic attention of his works. So we note the erotic elements. We might even mention Ivanov's friendship with Nikolai Gogol, wink, wink. Uh, but then we quickly move on. Uh, to talk about his masterwork, The Appearance of Christ to the People. Now, what Allison has shown us today, and I think this is, again, worth acknowledging and really worth celebrating, is the potential for looking through this discomfort, uh, for not just acknowledging, but also taking seriously the importance of the homoerotic gaze for Ivanov. Now, of course, and we all know this, it's not as if we as a field have completely refused to take such questions of sexuality in the 19th century seriously. Simon Karlinsky's landmark work on Gogol comes to mind, as does Eric Neyman's recent article on the Brothers Karamazov, to name really just two examples. But as Ani Kokobobo has discussed in her 19V blog post from just a few weeks ago, there has not yet been anything like a sexual revolution of 19th century studies in Slavic. And so I wonder, I'm curious really, Allison, how you pushed past the inertia of Russian art history here. Um, how did you keep looking at Ivanov's work long enough and serious enough to say something meaningful about his homoerotic aesthetic? I'm also curious whether you've encountered pushback um, or whether you've encountered encouragement and what this might have taught you about the state of the field at the current moment. And possibly to all of us, where else might we look to begin telling more thoughtful stories about gender and sexuality in the 19th century? So the second set of questions I wanna draw out really continues this line of thought and in particular about my use of the terms and Allison's use of the terms gender and sexuality um, in her talk. Allison, you mentioned in your talk how Ivanov's studies evoke a surprisingly and profoundly modern conception of gender and sexuality. For him, gender is a performance, it is fluid rather than innate. Which alongside your discussion of Ivanov's use of classical models and tropes of composite representation really left me wondering how modern and how classical Ivanov's conceptions of gender and sexuality are. And in fact, you know, you did mention this in your talk that this is this would be um, one possible explanation for um, some of these representations of men, uh, this classical heritage. But I wanted to push on that a little bit further and see if we can representation of gender. What happens if we compare Ivanov's gender fluidity with the gender fluidities of the late 19th century, for example, or of the decadence? The kinds of fluidities we might see, just to offer again one tiny example in the poetry of Zinaida Gipius, are we seeing then the same kind of composite or fluid gender um, that we see in Ivanov? Does Ivanov's work represent then a first step toward modern conceptions? or the final gasp of a classical tradition. Uh, and I would invite us here then, and this is uh, my final question, to ask this question about the 19th century in a broader sense. That is, in its status as a kind of pivot point, how does the 19th century represent both an end to an earlier age, but also the beginning of the new modern one? And does this impact how we interpret our objects of study, how modern or not, we're willing to go with them. Uh, so I'm going to stop there, and I guess I'll turn it back to Allison and also remind everybody that the questions, just put your name in the comment box if you wanna ask a question. And Sasha Spitalnik has generously offered to moderate that because I panicked when I was faced with the proposition. So thank you, Sasha, for that. Um, um, I'll turn it over to Allison. 
Oh, Molly, thank you so much. I, I just, I could listen to you talk and ask always the right questions all day. And I, I have to admit, I thought of you so often as I wrote this in terms of thinking about the kinds of questions that I, I hear you ask as discussant and as Subasednik and, um, and it made the book better. And that's true for many of you that I've been on panels with Anne and, and, uh, and Margaret and Galena, everybody. All right. Uh, oh man, these are big questions and I don't, I don't want to answer them at, at like horrifically long length. How did I push through the uncomfortable? Oh, that's such, a, that's such a good question. It was, I have to admit, it was really awful a lot of the time to work on this. I mean, there's, there's such a weird mix of beautiful and, and disturbing. And um, maybe this is the moment, I don't know if Trenton Olson is still here. I saw him at the beginning, but maybe this is the moment to reveal a little bit about my, my working method, which I realize is in the, the background there, um, in terms of how I live with these, these paintings and these um, elements of visual culture that, that I'm thinking about. Um, I always put them up on my wall. I kind of surround myself with them. And I have to say that working on Ivana, that this was some of the hardest to live with the images up all the time. That, I, that I've ever had. But forcing myself to do it meant that I kept looking and maybe that pushed me past the uncomfortable. I just kind of got used to seeing them. Um, and not that that ever made me less disturbed at what I, I think they do potentially contain. Um, but I, you know, I, I kept returning over and over to uh, Polly's work to that one chapter, that magical chapter that she wrote, that that made me feel brave. Every time I every time I read it, I thought, okay, she's she started this and she's okay, right? Like we all we all respect her and um, and nobody kind of came after her for doing it, so I I can do this too. Um, as far as did I get pushback, I think I, you know, I really isolated myself, maybe in a way that's not ideal when I wrote this. And uh, where I am now at the University of Louisiana, I don't have a lot of art history colleagues. I don't have anyone else in 19th century to really run this stuff past. So I think um, that isolation maybe was helpful in this regard because I, no one was there to tell me like, Ooh, don't, you know, don't, don't do that. What are you, what are you, why are you going in that direction? Um, I did, some of the only people who read it other than obviously the readers at, at Bloomsbury and um, I, won't, I won't put anyone on blast in, in this group who read it, but I did get feedback from, from some other art historians which was so valuable on this. Uh, but I did assign it to, as, a, as a draft chapter still in my Russian art survey that I run every other fall. And students ate it up. I mean, they, they were like, how did no one else write this? What do you mean you're one of the first to talk about this? And it was like that lit a fire under me, like, oh, well, if, if the new generation wants this kind of work and, and finds it palatable and agrees with what I'm arguing, then there must be a place where, where the, this belongs. And there certainly is in art history. I should say that the work of James Smalls, who's one of the best on 19th century um, homoeroticism, I mean, in particular in the French paintings of Jericho and Giraudet and others, he was a big inspiration for pushing through this, this kind of uncomfortability, I think, too. The other two questions, oh Molly, um, <laughs> uh, maybe maybe I'll grapple with this the second one first. This idea of the nineteenth century as the end of an age, but also the beginning of a new one. Oh man, that's so that's so good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that up on the bulletin board and, and think about it the rest of this week. Um, you know, I think that's maybe what I love about it, that it, it hinges both ways. It's like a door that, that swings in both directions. It is most definitely the end of some earlier period and, and the collapse of these earlier sensibilities is so tragic, I think, for, for men and for masculinity in particular. But then at the very same time, it is the beginning of something utterly new, something that's us, something it's the, that is the moderns, the contemporaries, and all the brokenness of the 20th century, you know, what, what T.J. Clark called the age of human smoke. That, I mean, that is the 19th century as well. So I think that's what I like about it. I like that it does that. I think that the unresolvability of the 19th century is what endlessly makes me love that this is what I chose to focus on. And maybe just to answer it quickly, your question about the composites, you know, at the end of the century and, you know, are they kind of, is Ivanova kind of beginning of this that then develops like a seed into something larger? I don't know if I, I maybe I think of him kind of, and these composites he makes of being similar to the 19th century and that it kind of goes both ways. Ugh, no pun intended, sorry everybody. Um, that it's more like, 
like like I see Michelangelo interestingly is making really similar composites in a way that is so modern and that, that, that great Renaissance scholars have tried to grapple with but then we've got somebody who's a contemporary of Yvonne of like uh, Delacroix who also is making kind of weird bodies that start as women and turn into men or start as as black women and turn into white men I mean weird just weird stuff so Yvonne I want to think of him I guess is in the mix and not as separate not as this this you know uh, alien Russian Eastern other but a part of some other larger modern sensibility about sexuality that starts in in various places maybe even as early as, as Michelangelo I mean it goes all the way back to Greek antiquity so it's all over the place modernity is isn't just the 19th century the 20th century as, as those of us in this room know it, it it's it seeds are everywhere I'll stop there Great, thank you so much, Allison and Molly. Um, so if anybody has any questions, uh, you can now submit them to the chat. I've opened up chat with everyone. So please go ahead and uh, send me a note if you'd like to speak or send me a question and I'll read it aloud. Uh, Mina Magda, uh, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you can go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I have a question that I thought I would just ask first since it's pretty broad <laughs> and maybe not that easy to answer, but I was just wondering if there's anything, if there's a specific aspect of or dimension to neoclassicism or even Apollo that sort of lends itself to expressions of homoeroticism in Russian cultural production, or as you put it, this sort of amorphous liminal expression of gender. And I asked this with my own research on the Ballet Russe in mind, uh, specifically like the more neoclassical productions such as Apollo or Afternoon of the Fawn, because I'm just sort of interested in tracing sort of this, the history of this connection to antiquity and homoeroticism. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. You're right that it is a little bit hard to answer um, and, and maybe would be answered by di in different ways by different people. I do talk not a lot, but a little bit more in the larger chapter about how certain neoclassical subjects lend themselves more to this kind of homoeroticism. Um, and, and those who are art historians will, will kind of nod their head and know exactly what I mean. So, you know, subjects like Ganymede and Apollo, you know, subjects from antiquity or mythology that are specifically known for uh, homoerotic narratives, i.e. they engage primarily in same-sex kinds of uh, liaisons, um, lend themselves to being depicted in this more homoerotic way than those who, in, in particular in Ovid's Metamorphosis, which is where so many of these subjects are coming from, uh, those who engage in, in straight sex, you know, don't tend to be eroticized in quite the same way, though even they, depending on the artist, can, can fall victim to or subject to this kind of, of bending. But I think because Apollo engages and not one, but two, and, and Ivanov is rare, I should point out too, in having both subjects collapsed into the space of the same, as you saw from the French examples, usually it's just one boy with Apollo in his own particular narrative. Um, but the, the fact that Apollo engages with Hyacinthus in this one narrative and he dies, Cyprus in this other narrative and he dies, this makes him particularly sort of rife for homoerotic kind of depiction as far as, as, far as I'm concerned. All right, great. Um, we have a question from Nadezhda Kizenko. Um, how did Ivanov respond to the concern his father expressed in the letter? And how confessional are his thoughts on reading the Bible? I.e., does he dwell on any sexual, sexual taboos there? Great questions. Um, you know, Ivanov is such an interesting case in 
also in that he, there are so many letters between him and his father. Um, unfortunately, just about just about none of, of what I, I uh, include in the book has been translated. In fact, uh, Elizabeth Volkenier and was Wendy Salmon still here, did one of the few volumes. If you have not gotten the Experiments journal from, I guess it was more than 10 years ago, where a ton of Pitivizhnik um, era uh, letters and documents were translated for the first time in English, that thing is invaluable and, and began so much of my own desire to read the greater narratives um, of these artists. So, uh, Nadezhda, I would say that I, I can't say that I remember specifically how he responded. He, he and Rulov both are very deferential to their fathers, which was common in this time period. In fact, the first chapter is largely about how I think Karl Rulov kind of couldn't get out from under his father and, and stayed immature for a long time because of this weird deferential sense uh, where he continued to call his father Papinka in, into his late 20s and 30s, whereas uh, others, you know, use the more formal Batushka in Russian and things like that. So um, Ivanov, as I mentioned very briefly in the talk, did not make the changes that dad called for. Uh, I believe Andre said that he should change Apollo so that he was sort of keeping time, the time of the music, uh, as though, again, as though it's a more instructional moment than this kind of post-coital, you know, kind of haze that it seems to be as he depicted it. Um, but that would have meant having to alter that touch, having to take the, the hand off of the boy's leg to make it do something else. So I think that's very revealing, just the, the didn't change it as the response, you know, is, is something. What was the second part of the question, Sasha? She said, what was the response to and then, so I'm sorry to put you on the spot. No, no, that's okay. Um, and how confessional are his thoughts on reading the Bible? That um, does he dwell on any sexual taboos there? My, what I, my gut wants to say very in terms of confessional, but the reality is very veiled would be my response. Um, that thoughts arising upon reading the Bible is heartbreaking. Um, if there's anything that somebody should jump on translating, I would love to see that in full translation for students along with many of the letters. Um, his desperation, his pleas, his, you know, endless God help me um, is, is very, very difficult to read. It was hard for me to translate it because I have to go slowly, you know, kind of word by word to make sure I'm getting it all, all right. And um, at the same time, he does not say, God help me, I, I'm attracted to boys. I mean, you know, there, there isn't anything like that as, as really there couldn't be in this time. And maybe I should point out too, as, as Polly wrote, in the article we keep talking about, um, we, a good amount of, of what Ivanov wrote, letters-wise and otherwise, has been destroyed. I mean, he, he specifically asked correspondents to destroy letters of his, and we might imagine the Soviets did something similar uh, when, when homosexuality became dangerous under Stalin and so on and so forth. So um, I think there's a lot to be read into the, the thoughts arising upon reading the Bible, but you do have to do that work. And I think that's where I wish I had more training, perhaps in, in literary studies of the kind Molly has, because as an art historian, uh, the way that we're taught to grapple with those kinds of texts, I think is different or limited even in some ways. Good question though. Yes, um, we have a question from Russell Valentino. Uh, I was struck by the differing appeals to the ordinary in the quoted texts from Komuchini and Andrei Ivanov. Um, in the first ordinary contrast, in the first, sorry, ordinary contrast, exquisite, and is something to avoid too much of. In the second, ordinary is grounded in a counter to, the, to moral depravity. Is this ordinary just a problem of translation or is it actually a contested territory that tells us something useful about cultural norms, values, etc.? Ooh, that's a big question. And I'm, you know, I'm not sure I'm, I can answer it. I'm, I'm pulling it up so that I can refresh my memory in terms of specific, this specific quote. Ah, you know, I didn't put the Russian, shoot. And I, I tried to be pretty, pretty good about any time there was, you know, kind of openness to, to the way I was translating it, uh, to include it, which, which is something that so many great literary scholars do. Um, I don't remember what the original Russian is for the ordinary here, uh, but I can certainly find out if Russell wants to email me separately. I'm, I'm easy to find that we can even and put my email in the chat or something. Um, what was the other half of the question? The, the, this idea that about the ordinary. Sorry, I'm having um, trouble tracking these. It's like summertime brain. I'm like, huh? Oh, what? Conference. Um, I guess. Uh, oh, 
is it a problem of translation or is it actually a contested territory that tells us something useful about cultural norms or values? Oh, oh I see. Well, again, I, you know, I, in, to answer it properly, I'd need to go back to what the Russian was and I don't remember off the top of my head, but I will say that I think this idea of the ordinary is contested ground artistically in this moment. I mean, this is, it's a little early for it, but it, it's going to lend itself to the discussions about genre painting that become so important to realism, uh, as Molly might say something about, um, and to Fedotov by the late 1840s and 1850s. The ordinary, uh, the, the tableau de genre is, is you know, is dangerous is not supposed to be what the neoclassical is about. The neoclassical is about these high subjects. And if you depict bodies that are too much, which I believe Camuccini is, is inferring here from the realm of the ordinary, from the realm of the genre, from the domain of real Italian boys posed for this, and that realness is here. This is not an academy nude this, this is a boy, a real boy that he seems to have looked at, perhaps longingly. Um, that strikes me as what Camuccini is pointing out, and that has both personal repercussions for Ivanov, but also speaks to larger kind of thinking and, and hierarchy of genres going on here in terms of history and neoclassical being the top, and then genre being quite a few tiers down from that. Great, thank you. Uh, Anne Lounsbury, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Sure, thank you. First of all, Alison, thank you for the talk. It was really wonderful and I, I learned a huge amount. And the question is um, a little bit dweeby and factual, basically about, about your discipline. And that is that do you, or, or do art historians in general, do you tend to approach the Nikolaevan period differently from how you approach the second half of the century in Russia? And, you know, in what ways? I'm just kind of Curious to learn more about how this period is, is seen as distinctive in visual culture or how it, um, uh, the pre-reform half of the 19th century more or less, how it kind of requires a certain way of, of looking because certainly in literary studies, there's a big split mm -hmm. uh, in the way we, we tend to think about literature pre and post reform. So I'm just curious to hear what what happens in, in art history? Yeah, you know, the coming off of last week with the, the first Divinatsu uh, Vyeka meeting being about periodization, it, you know, it's, a, it's a slam dunk of a question. Um, I, I almost want to say every art historian of, and I should say of the few who work on this, because I the mean, first half of the 19th century is, is really rare, not, not quite as desolate as the, the 18th century, as Polly made clear last week. Um, but, you know, even pushing this far back is, is, is weirdly so unusual in art history. Um, and I really hope this book partly opens up the, these first couple decades. Um, but of the few who grapple with it, um, I think each of us does it somewhat differently. I can speak for myself in that if you saw from the, from the book and the, the three sections, I keep Nikolaev and Russia pretty, pretty firmly separate from what comes after. Uh, it feels different to me. Uh, you know, periodizations can be a little bit arbitrary. Maybe we overemphasize it sometimes in art history in particular because, because it's all about these styles and these isms. But um, I think the, the kind of autocratic uh, Russia that existed under Nicholas I is is and had important repercussions for artists that loosen a bit after he dies in 1855. Um, you know, I don't ever want to draw th these distinctions too, too sharply, as Polly pointed out in the periodization seminar last week, you know, looking at voices that are below the, the the shouts that are Brulov and Ivanov and Fedotov, I mean, the major canonical figures, might tell a really different story about the experience of artists under Nicholas. And I'm not familiar nearly enough with those, as, as she pointed out, they're just starting to be uh, translated and starting to service because of the endeavors of the Academy. But, you know, I call this first half of my book that grapples with Brulov and Ivanov in the first half of the century, autocratic masculinity for a reason, because for me, it is the most autocratic period in terms of the, the structures for what men are supposed to be are supposedly the firmest, and yet maybe the, the most painful in terms of they're endlessly paradoxical, what men are supposed to be they can never live up to. And what you're supposed to be in one instance is different from how you're supposed to be in another and so on and so forth. Whereas those things loosen, I don't know necessarily if it's because of Nicholas himself, though I think the culture that surrounds his autocracy is kind of what bleeds out symptomatically in gender for men, at least across the board after his death. 
Thank you very much. That's that was a, um, your your answer was much more interesting than my question. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, uh, uh, Raman Utkin, if you want to ask your question, I can unmute you. Thank you. Yes, I do want to ask my question. Uh, Alison, good to see you. Great to see everyone. Good to see you too. Uh, Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Could, wouldn't have missed it. Uh, so many questions, but I think uh, asking a question about a book that's about to come out, right? It's just a slightly different genre of a Q&A too. So I um, kind of have maybe a larger comment-like question and then a smaller question because I also uh, I include this painting in my Queer Russia uh, seminar that I teach. I wanted to follow up on something Molly had started in her comments, uh, had mentioned in her comments <clears throat> about uh, gender and sexuality studies in uh, 19th century Russian uh, culture. And because uh, one book that wasn't mentioned is Suzanne Fuso's Discovering uh, Sexuality in uh, Dostoevsky. And that um, book also was you know, pioneering in many ways. And uh, what its central argument was, was to identify a, uh, if not sui generis, but then kind of a, 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 a theory of sexuality that predates Freud. And I think what uh, I'm wondering about is what can we, whether we could draw similar uh, observations from either Ivanov or, or, or your larger projects, but ideas about gender and sexuality that predate Foucault, <laughs> uh, because it is Foucault who, of course, is you know famously uh, suggests that gender and sexuality they're not innate historical categories that these are tightly um, uh, uh, kind of constructed social phenomena. And with this painting in particular, it's, um, it's setting in this lush, uh, natural kind of uh, landscape seems to suggest uh, an innate naturalness to, to that tightly composed uh, composition with references to, um, to the the, the myth, right, the, 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 the Greek myth. So, and it seems to suggest that precisely this, this is natural and then everything else is just a social con uh, construct. Mm -hmm. And um, because with that, I also wonder whether we can actually push back against the idea of gender fluidity because it, the gender fluidity only occurs with uh, the prepubescent male uh, models. Otherwise, Ivanov is a really hunky kind of a painter. Like, you know, uh -huh. like, his, his men are like, uh, hello. And, uh, it, and it all happens at the exclusion of women. Uh, um, so, and the tinier kind of question, um, I wonder whether you grapple with it in, in, in your chapter at all, the painting is unfinished. And uh, the, I, I wonder whether it's because the, the story, the myth is just so tragic, right? And that, that ideal that is represented, uh, in the painting is about to just completely uh, uh, come crashing down. And maybe he is undermining his own message of this uh, naturalness of, the, um, of, of, of these sexual relations uh, between a much older man with these younger boys. I, 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 uh, so I don't know. And it's actually a question that has come up in the discussion of this painting with my students. Again, thank you so much. Thank you. I, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that you teach this. I think we talked about it before when I came to Davidson and um, I hope that this chapter ends up being something that is fun to assign, at least maybe not every year, but, but some years and I'll be very interested to, to hear what students think if, if you can take the time to write me. Um, as for, you know, theories of sexuality that predate Freud and Foucault, uh, I'm going to go ahead and this is being recorded, two thumbs up, yes, let's, all of us. I mean, yes, absolutely, there should be theories that, that uh, I mean, I'm, I don't, I don't think we should throw them out by any means. They have 
brilliant things to say that got us a huge amount of the way in. But I think part of what's so fascinating about studying literature and poetry and painting and sculpture and all these different forms is that they give us so much more nuance and insight into these periods than these theories could ever possibly contain. I mean, it's really exciting when you spend time slow looking or conducting case studies like this on really one work and seeing the tendrils that it has out, uh, you realize that these, these theories, as, as encompassing as they seem, are not doing the, these realms of experience justice. Uh, and maybe that's another pitch for my book in terms of you know, where I really started was um, it's so easy to think, ah, history's all about men. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge feminist scholar, uh, and there's a certain part of me that's so guilty for working on masculinity in this way. But when you really think about it, it's similar to sexuality. It's like, we have this huge blind spot to the real experiences of men and women. I mean, we have a huge blind spot to the experiences as we're now discovering uh, of, of all sorts of people uh, of, of color, uh, of various kinds of experience, of various degrees of Queer. I mean, all, all across the board, we need every piece of data uh, from the arts and, and every cultural realm that we can to, to begin making new theories that make someone the new Freud, the new Foucault of, of gender, for sure. Um, of course, now I've forgotten the second half of your question. Why can't I ever try? Like, I could do the first half and then I always lose everybody's second half. Oh, it was too unwieldy a question. Uh, it's an unfinished painting. Uh, ah, Yes. Oh, I should probably talk about it more in the chapter. Now that, I, now that I think about it, I should have sent this to you is what I should have done. And you would have been like, hello, the unfinished. No, I mean, I do talk about it. Um, I will say that it, it is not talked about as unfinished enough. And I'm glad to hear that you're maybe teaching it specifically as he's not able to, to bring this to a state of resolution. Um, because it looks so polished in so many ways. It's easy to go, well, that's unfinished? Like, wow, that's, that's a spectacular painting to be not done. Um, but, you know, I think where I land on it in the chapter, maybe more vaguely than I should have. Oh, great. Now this is being recorded. Whoever's reviewing this book now knows where the little spot is to come after me. Um, no, I think I land on it vaguely as, you know, he's not able to finish this or the self-portrait because there's too much of his own tortured eroticism invested in the painting. And, you know, I, I hate to say that because you can't really map that on the appearance of Christ to the people, which also is basically an unfinished painting despite 20 plus years that he worked on it. Um, so I don't know that that, you know, saying his, his sexuality is what inhibits his ability to finish this is, is necessarily right, but it's one potential explanation. Um, and I guess what I want more than anything is for other people to pick up this work, as Molly said, uh, and, and continue this work on gender and sexuality in the Russian context, in particular, in the first half of the 19th century. We need it very badly. Great. Uh, Christine Ruan, if you want to ask her a question, um, I can mute you or you can mute you. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yes. yes, OK. Um, I would like to go back to the issue of classicism in Russia, because I, I think sometimes we forget that um, men who went to the gymnasium or gymnasia received a classical education. They learned Latin and Greek and read the texts and all of that. And I, I think that that's, for them, this is a familiar world. And I think that that might be a part of it. I don't know where, um, Ivanov went to school, but certainly it was in the environment of educated men to be familiar with all these Greek myths and the stories and have read them. Excuse me, I almost knocked over my iced tea. Oh, no. <laughs> so that's just one thing I would like to say. But the other thing is, is that I would really like to press you, Allison, a little bit more on how you see your work uh, expanding our understanding of gender in the 19th century. And you started off by saying, what is it that art can contribute to this specifically? So could you talk about that a little bit more directly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think both are both are important questions. Maybe I'll start with the second one, um, just in terms of you know, I think it's a, it's a difficult thing to answer 
Well, it shouldn't be though, now that I think about it, you know, what, what can art contribute to our understanding of gender? Um, I think we've seen in art history, though certainly in other fields in the last 30, 40 years, that thinking about women's experience by looking at art uh, has been illuminating in, in ways that are they're almost shocking. I mean, the, the, the idea that we didn't look at what the lives of women in these earlier periods were like by studying the art that was made predominantly by male artists, so certainly by women too, um, has had such an impact on, on my particular field. So I think what I, what I hope for is something similar. And I almost fear that answering that question too directly limits the, the potential of future scholarship. I certainly found through, maybe through a kind of hybrid of methods, none of which are necessarily innovative, but I found that by looking, as you saw me do today, at paintings very deeply. I mean, every chapter really focuses primarily on one, but then has others that come in to, to do various work. But looking at specific works, artworks, in tandem with letters and in tandem with criticism, I mean, this is a very old fashioned kind of art history. It's a kind of biographical art history that has fallen out of fashion. But that seems to be the magic for, for gender studies in terms of art history, at least. It's, uh, and I wonder how much flack, to go back to what Molly said, how much pushback I've gotten. If there's anything I've gotten pushback about, it's actually this kind of looking at the experience of artists and what it means for gender on a larger level that, that pulls from all these different sources, that pulls from you know, thoughts arising while reading the Bible, what Camuccini said, the little letters he wrote to his dad, the academy, you know, putting it all together like a, a, a pot of you know, soup uh, and, and seeing what the flavors are at the end. Um, so I almost think that it, it, what we discover from art is going to be different based on how you do it. If you look at paintings in isolation, which I very rarely do. I look very deeply, certainly, at artworks. As you saw, visual analysis is central to everything I do. Uh, but I combine that with lots of other kinds of very traditional historical data. Um, and, and as I said, I think what I want or what I'm hoping to discover is the experience of men. I mean, my work is phenomenological in the sense that I want to know what it was like to be a man in a period that's gone, which means I want a lot of what I'm not. I'm not a man that lived in the 1830s. I'm not a man even living right now. Um, and I like it that history forges this empathic space moving across perceptive realms to, to an extreme degree. And I think painting, because it's visual and, and because it can be sensorial beyond the visual, allows this kind of recreation of experience in this way. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, I have a comment from Alexandra Smith. Thank you very much for your brilliant lecture. I think that your point about vulnerable male bodies uh, might be able to uh, can be interpreted in a modern context too. Mm. It suggests that there is an implied anxiety about the world that is becoming fragmented uh, and about the loss of idyllic space. Yes, yes, yes. I, what was it? So someone Smith said that? I, I couldn't agree more. Alexander Smith. Yeah. Alexander Smith. Um, yeah, you know, so much of this book, even though I try to be as, as rigorous uh, and objective a historian as I possibly can be, this stuff can be so much of it mapped onto 20th and 21st century male experience. Um, for a long time, I think I, I sort of hoped that this would be like volume one of some sort of two or three volume, you know, like, you know, picturing Russia's men, 19th century, 20th century, but others are doing that work and, and I'm, I'm fine with leaving it in that way, but I'm glad that he felt that that vulnerability aspect was mapping into the future because I feel it too. Right. Um, we have, sorry, I'm just going through our chat. Uh, a question from Annie Kin Moss. Anne, if you want to unmute yourself. Thanks. Thanks for this really exciting talk, Alice. Uh oh. Mike, can you hear me now? Sorry. Oh, now we can hear you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Mostly I was expressing enthusiasm about the book. Um, oh, but I do have a, a question um, that, that maybe selfishly goes to my own work in the 20th century right now. I'm working actually on composite shooting in cinema. 
like special effects layers. So I'm really interested in, so my ears pricked up about uh, when you use that term, and I'm really interested in the stakes of that term for art history. Um, you know, what is it really, is, is it a method of art historical analysis that you're uncovering these layers? I mean, it was a very convincing story that you told to find Ivanov in the figure of the flute player um, by showing us these layers of historical moments of um, other figures that look just like it. Um, or is it a method, are you claiming that it's kind of a method of painting? And then, so that's the kind of the first part. The second part is um, about how that maps on to the notion of gender that you're thinking through. Because it, I mean, it, it's very convincingly a question about um, gender fluidity in some ways or gender performativity um, mm -hmm. that I can, that I've found convincing. Um, but I, I mean, you also use terms like construction and composite. And I was kind of trying to understand the ways in which you were making a claim about the composite as a form of gender performativity for Ivanov. And if so, in some ways, it's not really a performance of, of gender. It's a performance of you know, role playing in the picture, like active role taking or, or you know, being in the picture rather than performing a kind of gender. Um, and that seems to be a separate argument. Yeah, I, I know what you mean, and I, in some, in some ways, I wish I, I wish the book wasn't coming out so I can incorporate more of the things that everyone's pointing out. These are all such, such great questions and, and provocative, and, and I hope it maybe just means that there's so much more work to be done on Ivanova and others like it. I mean, that, that's, that, the chapter may be done, but, but the, the stories that are here to be told and to be thought through are not. Um, you know, your question about layers and about the kind of comparative visual analysis that I did in particular here at the end of the talk version, though it unfolds a bit more slowly, I think. It, this is the longest chapter in the book, so I don't know why I shot myself in the foot and, and tried to make this 25 minute talk, but, but I think it came across at least the major points. You know, we do this in art history, I would say. The, the art history is built on this kind of comparative method. It's one of its cornerstones that you put one thing up next to another thing and you talk about them together. <laughs> um, it's actually something we get in trouble for and I think uh, some scholars are starting to push against like you can put anything up next to anything and make claims that there are comparative you know elements um, and I try to be really careful. I'm aware that, that this, you know there you can pull straws out of this and it falls apart kind of easily so it's a dangerous thing to do in some ways but I, I see these resonances and I think they're meaningful. And so my job as an art historian is to say, I see resonances, do you see them too? I mean, that's, that's half of what we're doing. And then of course, to put it together with lots of other evidence to, to build that case very tightly. So I would say in terms of, of my doing that, that's pretty typical in art history. As far as the language I use, which you pointed out, you know, the, the language of composite and, and liminality, you find that in art history. And I think all in the art history, like the work of James Smalls that I pointed out before, it's, it's in some of the other books that have been talked about in terms of Dostoevsky and work on sexuality in Russian literature. Um, so I don't know that I, I'm co-opting it so much as I know it exists and I just kind of took it on without even thinking about it that much because it seemed the right way to describe it. I couldn't think of any other way to describe what he's doing, and others have used similar terminology for other artists. Great. Uh, we have a question from Nikita Balagurov. I wonder if your discussion of Ivanov's homoeroticism is entangled with the whole Win Winkelmann's homoerotic tradition of art writing, uh, and two, uh, any other responses to the painting that you are aware of? Uh, third question, what is at stake in emphasizing Ivanov's homoeroticism? Uh, yes, Winkelmann figures much more largely in the chapter. Um, he is looming to go back to Christine asking, now I'm remembering you asked me about the, the academy and his training and, you know, is he a part of this uh, system of kind of classicizing education in Russia in this moment? And the answer is absolutely yes. The Imperial Academy of Arts is for sure in the business of producing honorable citizens, upstanding men, all, all of this. Um, and Winkelmann is huge in that regard. In fact, we have a portrait uh, of Andrei Ivanov, Alexander's 
absent father, where he has uh, the Winkelmann tome behind him. Like it's obviously something that was read in the family. Uh, Ivanov came from a family of artists, so his dad giving him advice about painting is coming from a, a specific place of, of I know about this son. Um, so Winkelmann, yes, um, and look in the in the larger book for for more on that. Um, Oh boy, I should be writing down these questions. Al, Al, Sasha, what was the, the next part? There were three parts to this one, right? Oh, you're muted, I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, the second part of the question is, have there been any other responses to the painting that you are aware of? Yeah. And the third part is, what is at stake in emphasizing Ivanov's homoeroticism? Got it. Uh, responses, yes, um, and you can find some of them in the book. Um, there was another uh, sort of overseer of the pensioners in Rome whose name was Bertolt Tor Torvaldsen, um, a Danish sculptor who, who was also known for his ephibic homoerotic depictions of, of youths, um, and he too responded um, somewhat more ambiguously to this painting. Neither Camoncini nor he were were sort of like in raptures over it. Both of them were a bit disturbed by what they saw, uh, though they don't come out and say, you know, why, why do you have why is Hyacinth is so young, he's way too young. No, none of them are, are coming out in that way. Uh, but Camuccini similarly is concerned that, that Ivanov doesn't understand the classical sublime, basically. What's at stake in the homoerotic? Uh, everything, I don't know, I mean, that's overstating it, but, but so much, I mean, I think uh, answering that is like answering how important is your sex life to you or to your identity. I mean, uh, I would say very to most of us. Uh, of course, there are, there are some, the, the answer would be not very, uh, but for most of us, our, our sex lives and who we're attracted to and the desire and how it drives so much of the way we operate in this world does help build how we think of ourselves. So what's at stake in examining the homoerotic is trying to understand how someone's masculinity is constituted not entirely by any means, but in part by what their longings are in, in that regard. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, we have a question from Anastasia Loisova. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing names. Uh, if you want to un unmute yourself. Uh huh. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. And I have uh, one question. What do you think, if there are any influence uh, of the absence of uh, female nature, uh, the absence of an opportunity to draw female bodies in Russian uh, academy on this subject? So what do I think of the absence uh, of, of females or the out in, in uh, yeah, yeah. female, yeah, uh, female nature? Yeah, I, you know, I wish that this chapter had been able to be even longer than it was. <laughs> It's such, a, it's such an important element of Ivanov's work. And again, it's something that Polly points out in that chapter we keep talking about, um, where there is this kind of absence of the female uh, in, in both Ivanov's life, it seems like, and in his work. Uh, he's not the only artist like this. There's a great article by uh, Linda Nochlin, the, the scholar who passed recently, about, I think it's called Jericho or the Absence of Women, where we discover something similar in terms of there being a real, a real lack of female nature, as you're describing in, in, his, in his works. Um, I, it, we'd have to get more into biography to, to analyze the, the way that there is this kind of increasing absence of the female in Ivanov's work, but I would point out that there's an increasing absence just of other human beings for Ivanov as time goes on. And maybe this is the, one of the tragic aspects of his life that uh, should also be worked on a bit more, that he, as he's writing it for the thoughts arising upon reading the Bible, uh, it becomes clear that his desire is to just get away from people entirely. He sees that as the, the way forward. Uh, so he speaks about abstinence, but he just also talks about you have to isolate yourself, um, which I think can be interpreted in a number of different ways. Uh, but we do know that he increasingly is suspicious. Polly talks about this in the chapter. Uh, he thinks he's being poisoned. Um, he is early on engaged or, or was potentially going to be married, but his father said, don't do it. You won't be able to go to Rome. And so he doesn't. And there's never at least in the record, never really anything with a woman again in, in terms of romantic love at uh, that level. Um, so 
you know, it isn't just the absence of female. I think there is an increasing absence or, or lack uh, towards the end of Ivanov's life of, of people in general, though by the time he, he gets back to Russia for the last, whatever it is, 57 days or something of his life, he's feted and lauded and, you know, he meets with Chernyshevsky, you know, Kromskoy, he thinks he's his hero. And um, so that must have been odd for him after being so isolated towards the end in Rome to then get back to Russia and have everybody want to be his friend, basically. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I have a question from uh, Maria Tarutina. Uh, thank you so much for such a fantastic talk. I was really struck by the anatomical distortions in Ivanov's self-portrait, in addition to the preposterous hat. <laughs> Do you see any particular significance uh, in the disproportionately large head vis-a-vis -vis the body? Ooh. Maria so good. Um, I'm looking at it now. Uh, you know, I no, I don't, I don't. I'm not saying I didn't see it, Masha, because because you're weird anatomically. It's weird. The hands are really little too. Like they're like these little strange fists. Um, but but the the hat was what struck me. I guess it's it's the confluence of this gaze and what Dan Healy so brilliantly talks about in his book. Uh, on homosexuality in Russia you know, expansively across time. Um, this idea of the significant glance, I think, is, is what I wanted to try to latch onto here. Um, I remember, actually, if you don't mind, I'll share the screen real quickly, um, because I wanted to show you all, if you haven't seen it, what this thing, can you see my screen now? Mm -hmm. um, it's so little. Yeah, where is it? Uh, this is it in the Tretyakov. Um, they really have it in a spot where you, you can interact with it very much. And it's near a bunch of other Ivanovs that are the studies uh, for Appearance of Christ and, and earlier paintings that I think get more attention. Um, but it's, it's so striking, even though it's a little painting, when you see it in person, that, that the significance of that, that looking and how he highlighted the white in the eyes uh, just really unnerved me. And it was only when I read uh, Dan on, on this kind of homoerotic subculture and how carefully in Nicholas's Russia you had to signal this kind of activity that I thought in combo with the hat, which seems to just kind of further emphasize this, this cock of the head and the look out from under, uh, it's just so coy, it's so strange. I do say in the larger chapter, uh, because this is following the chapter on Brulov's self-portraits, that this is such a weird portrait from the standpoint, and Brulov is already pretty strange in terms of, he just painted himself endlessly, there's so, so many. And Ivanov's not that way, um, but at least Brulov always figured himself in terms of accurate age, generally. Like Kiprinsky and Ivanov are both weird in, in they, they don't really show themselves how old they are in the moments that they are. And this is a good example. I, I wanna say Ivanov is like 28, 29, maybe, maybe that's a little, but he's much older than he seems. He seems like a teenager in this picture too, which I think also could be meaningful uh, because as Healy talks about, there, there's so much of an uneven power dynamic to homosexual liaisons in St. Petersburg in this moment where a lot of the interactions that you can have are with the, the driver of your carriage, are with the attendant in the bathhouse. So there's an uneven power dynamic that he may also be emphasizing here uh, that I, I don't really go into in the book because I thought it might be pushing a little too hard where, where I can't prove something. But you're right, his proportions are strange here and seem to speak to age and power structures that maybe feed into the sexuality. Okay, we have a question from Ming, a general historical question for Allison. Have you come across expression as death of realism, which is followed by impressionism? What? Oh, oh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Is it in the chat? Should I read it? What? You just read uh, it? Exactly like yeah, it it's in the chat. I can read it again. Um, have you come across expression as death of realism, in quotations, uh, which is followed by impressionism? Is, is she still here? Can she, does she want to unmute and explain? I'd love to understand the question better, but I'm not sure I'm getting it. Oh, Anne, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, I'm just guessing at the meaning of this question, but um, in literary studies, there's this kind of it's almost like a trope that, um, you know, realism's dying. It has to, it's going to be overcome by something else. Maybe it's a reference to that, asking if there's an analog in art historical discourse that, you know, realism is played out 
this is a guess, actually, I, the questioner, but that was what it signaled to me. I would say definitely. I mean, we, we, yeah, we read Death of the Author and Roland Barton, all that in art history, too. Maybe I'm thrown by it because realism, technically, though there's an overlap here, realism comes after Ivanov. He's still part of this neoclassical reaching into romantic tradition that's predating that development, though Ivanov lives long enough that, that we're into realism as it's being born in Russia, uh, but it's certainly not his interest. He's, he's not a, a realist painter, would be my answer to that. Can I just, I'm sorry to jump in, I was out of the queue, but I would just say that this is one of those moments when, um, uh, and Molly's the person to speak to this, um, when, you know, terminology in art history as opposed to in literary study becomes really important because it's just not necessarily clear all the time what we're talking about when we say realism. So this is really useful to me. Thank you. Yeah, Molly, if you haven't read Molly's book, that's, that's the place I can to go. Jump in. I'm being called out. I, I can't avoid it at this point. Um, it's true, Anne, and, and I totally agree with this. I would, I would say in the case of Ivanov, the way in which he's been understood by Polly, if she's still here in her book, but also by many others, is largely, you know, along the, along the lines of how we understand Gogol in literary studies. Um, as a kind of, as, as a sort of hybrid or in between romanticism and realism. And so if we think about something like the accusation that was thrown at Ivanov about his, and I, I can't remember the Italian, but it was brute realism, essentially, is what he was being accused of. Mm -hmm. um, and the same accusation is thrown at the early members of the natural school that, right, I mean, it's, it's a vulgarity. Uh, really. And, and I think this is how we could understand Ivanov as a hybrid figure is that even though he's not, he would have never called himself a realist, this isn't what he's doing. Um, and frankly, you know, there was only something of a kind of proto sense of this in the visual arts at this point, especially in terms of a kind of ideological realism. Um, but his emphasis on the naturalism and the realism of his depictions I think we, we are invited to see as something that is sort of um, breaking through the classical ideals that he would have been representing otherwise. And so in a way, he's sort of subverting the composites of the classical tradition, where typically you would have combined, you know, and this is sort of one of the tenets of classical aesthetics, is that you combined the most beautiful and ideal eyes, the most beautiful and ideal chin, and you combine all of this to create this most beautiful and ideal figure. Uh, and he is kind of doing that in his method. He's using this composite classical technique. Um, but and that is sort of kind of real romantic hybrid is, is, is this closeness you talk about, Allison. Um, these moments of intimacy or intensity that speak to a kind of proximity that would have never been um, that in some sense would have been smoothed out of a classical ideal. So I think that, um, you know, we could think of him as something of an analog for Gogol. He gets paired with him a lot, not only because they were friends and, and they were both in, in Rome, um, but I think also they both function as these transitional figures. I'll stop there. <laughs> no, that's great. I see Polly has her video on and we, we've called her out about 17,000 times. Polly, do you want to say anything in, in your own <laughs> defense here? Have I misattributed or quoted you in any way? Um, no, not at all. The first thing is just an apology. I'm sorry. I know how distracting it is. Um, I'm, it's been homeschooling um, issues here. Um, I have massively enjoyed this debate. There's been a couple of bits I've missed, so I, I'm slightly wary of of speaking in case I've missed something. I'm just, but actually, if I, I, if I can just say, um, Alison, thank you for your comments about my work. Um, I, I didn't escape scot-free in writing that article all those years ago. And um, I delivered, the paper it was based on was the very first conference paper I ever gave as a graduate student. And the very first question I took after the very first conference paper that I ever gave was, um, that was my intention to out Ivanov, and if so, was that because I hadn't come to terms with my own sexuality? So that was a bit of a baptism 
by fire. Um, and can I say this debate has been so much more sophisticated <laughs> and advanced and understanding. So that has been a real joy. Um, so I found so much of this riveting. I am going to watch this again on YouTube because I think it's been so rich. And But one of my questions, and as I say, I'm a little wary because this may have come up when I had to skip out the room, was um, the relationship with the Danish sculptor Torvaldsen who, I know you talked about um, Camuccini and then Torvaldsen was his sort of partner in crime in, in monitoring students. And I don't know if this has come up, but I think that Torvaldsen's work has um, similarly operates at times in these interstices between the great Winkelmann inspired, um, a sort of very strong and powerful male body aesthetic and then the slippage into sometimes more effeminate um, visual modes. And Alison, I just wondered if you had anything to comment on that. If this has been covered, just tell me to tell me to shush. So uh, only only very briefly did I did I mention that because someone else asked what was the response? Were there more responses beyond Camuccini? And I said yes. Torvaldsen also has kind of ambiguous things to say. He's not entirely supportive of what Ivanov's doing, but he also isn't completely, you know, uh, upset at it either. Um, Torvaldsen is, his work is so understudied and is so strange in kind of a similar way. He too is a, a great uh, depictor of this ephibic, uh, beautiful uh, masculinity in a similar moment, but of course he's a sculptor. So he's doing this in a way that's maybe even more arresting because it's three-dimensional um, and therefore has an eroticism or an erotic charge that, that, that is heavy in its own sense. Um, I'm so appreciative that you shared that story uh, about the, the question that, that you got um, at the very first conference. Boy, you are brave that this was the, <laughs> the first thing you ever presented. I know I've been sitting on this for a while and, and worried about it. I mean, I, I worry endlessly that I just, I want to keep working on Russian art so badly, I think as so many of us do. And I'm so fearful that I'll just say one time, the, the one thing that, uh, that, that will upset the scholars there that I respect so much and they'll, they won't let me reproduce the works anymore or, or they you know, won't invite me to come for conferences and things. And I mean, I think it's a very real concern for many of us. And in the end, I decided I, I sort of in your wake, I can't let that stop me from doing the work that I think needs to be done on artists like Ivanov. So just hoping for the best here. And Alison, on that note, I mean, I, I appreciate your apprehension, but really courage. I, I think we, you know, I think we shouldn't underestimate the appetite amongst the most um, exciting and brilliant of our colleagues in Russia. And some of them are in this room. Um, to rethink approaches and methodologies and priorities. Um, now, it may be they've chosen never to tell me, but I have, you know, that, that, that question which I had was from um, an American scholar, and it was in a conference in Britain, the vast majority of whose audience was, was British. Um, I've never had a negative word about this particular direction, which I very tentatively started and now you're following with such panache. I've never had adverse comment about that from Russians. I've had them say, golly, that was, you know, that was new. <laughs> that, 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 that's different. Um, but not in, not in a, an, you know, not in a difficult way. And I know, I mean, if I can cite, I, I think um, Andrei Shabanov's recent work on the Pyridvizhniki, how he's rethinking, and I think very effectively, what their intentions might have been to start with that has met with real resistance um, from Russian art historians. So if anything, I think we get, I mean, I know all of us have had times when we've met with obstacles to the research we're trying to do, but I think as well, um, in a way, we are given a, a little bit of a pass by being non-Russian and coming at it with new methodologies, which I certainly, and I feel there's been a real shift in the last two years, actually, and I in another world, I'd be a sociologist and be thinking about what that says about the political situation in Russia at the minute. Um, because I think there is, I have met with um, the most sort of open-minded responses in the last two to three years, sadly unable to test that at the moment because none of us are, are getting there. But, you know, I would, I mean, I, I will be rooting for you as your book hits um, Russian soil and I hope I'm right that you will be surprised by some of the excitement that it should quite rightly prompt. 
I appreciate you saying that. And I, I guess what I'd like to say is that that's been my experience too. Individual scholars and librarians and curators have been so supportive of my work. And there, there have been obstacles as all of us have, have uh, encountered. Um, but I guess my fear is mostly just the, the position of the government more largely where I know that, you know, understandings of, of uh, homosexuality are not what they are here. And I, I tried to, to treat Ivana with, with a, as you do, with a great deal of sympathy uh, and, and sensitivity and carefulness, knowing that, that culturally their stance on this is very different from ours. But my, my hope is the same, Russian, Russian scholars uh, reading this work is, is going to be the thrill of, of my career thus far, for sure. Can I just do a, a quick prompt? I've had the great privilege of reading the book. Go buy it. It's great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for saying that. All right, so we're gonna try and wrap up around 2 p.m., which gives us about eight or so minutes. Um, we can go a few minutes over, but we're gonna try and cut it off around two. So Allison, let me know if this works for you. I can read out a few questions at once and you can choose what to answer or try to, <laughs> or try to answer a few things at once. Does that work for you? Yes, absolutely. And I do apologize. I don't know why my brain isn't quite hanging on to the questions today. I usually am, am oh. able to, but it's like I, this video mode is wearing me out in a way that's a little unusual. I'm sure lots of us have experienced this Zoom fatigue thing, but I have my pen ready. Yep. Sasha, you go. Go with these questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So a question from Colleen Lucy. Uh, thank you for your beautifully insightful talk, Allison. It's fascinating to hear your discussion of the evolution of the male youth's image particularly that through the women's erasure, Ivanov can uncover the ideal masculine form. Is this a pattern you see among Ivanov's contemporaries or is it particular to him? And more broadly, what are the implications for the structuring and formulation of masculinity that defines itself primarily by looking through and beyond women to find a new definition of manhood? Uh, so, and a question uh, from Kevin Moss. Um, Fantastic work. I'm not a 19th century specialist, but my gut feeling is that Ivanov expressing his sexuality through both Rome and the classical tradition is part of a long line of cultural figures going back to Winckelmann, Byron, and on through the 19th century to the Oxford Hellenists of the Victorian, Victorian era. Italy and Greece were always a place to find greater sexual freedom as well as validation through the classics. Google too, for that matter. Uh, Nagrodska in, in Wrath of Dionysus and Kuzmin in Wings also use Italy as a location for this purpose. Um, and we have a question from Sergei Bogatidov. Uh, did contemporary critics comment on the issue of what we call now sexuality? They would probably use the word moral in their reaction to Ivanov's paintings. Um, shall, I, shall I read another or should I stop there? Sure, go ahead. I'm, I'm good so far. Okay. Um, on Anne's question, I would, uh, this is from Louise Hardiman. Um, on Anne's question, I would add, this is more of a comment. Um, I would add the comment that the imperial project feels more visible in the Nikolaivan period, whether the commission to Sonsa for the Amnesty Rasiskova Gosugarstva Academy artists still working on St. Isaac's building of the new Hermitage, etc. It is a period when foreign artists are still being hired for imperial commissions. Um, a question from Jana Rafonova. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. I'm interested in the sociological aspect of erotic culture in the 19th century. Was the homoeroticism and fluid gender a marker of higher classes, or is there any visual evidence that lower classes had the same experience? Um, and I think I'll stop there for now. Okay, yeah, I think I think I've got enough to grapple with some seemed a little bit more like comments. So I'm not sure if I'll be able to speak to them. But um, maybe I'll start with the last one, because I find this so fascinating. And I, I do want to sort of pitch for this becoming something that, that other scholars work on more, especially grad students, if, if they're in the zoom room here. Um, this notion of, of homoeroticism and class, I think is huge. Um, and and really needs more work. Um, there are two ways to grapple with it. One is is the depiction itself classed in the sense that you know are these paintings that Ivanov and others who make neoclassical 
classical works, you know, th they're for the upper classes like that. This is not in the way that genre painting in other cultures and in other periods is sort of trickling down from middle class buyers. Russia and many have worked on this. I, I don't know if Margaret's still in the room, uh, but this idea that, that there's a really limited market in terms of who's buying the works themselves is, is central. So I would say kind of maybe is a too simple answer, but one that I think does hold that homoeroticism in painting is for the upper classes, I, I think is a safe thing to say. I, I mean, certainly the, the academy has these annual exhibitions that, that those of other classes are seeing, but in terms of buyers, these, there's a real limited class for these. And Ivanov knows that. The other side of this though, in terms of homoeroticism and class, in terms of sexual experience, I think is where that book by Dan Healy and others that are just starting to, to really come to the fore are so important because um, uh, Karlinsky, Simon Karlinsky, who Molly mentioned quite a while ago, and this really important book on, on the sexual labyrinth, isn't it called The Sexual Labyrinth of Gogol, that book? I love, I mean, what a title. Um, is, is fascinating because it talks about these homosexual subcultures in Petersburg in the first half of the, the 19th century. And Karlinsky makes it sound like it's like, it's like everywhere. It's no big deal. Everybody, you know, everybody's having sex with everybody and it's upper classes and, um, and it's, it's like, a, you know, it's an elite kind of thing, basically, as far as I remember Karlinsky talking about it. But when you read Healy, who does this really entrenched historical work, what you discover is, it's not just an elite phenomenon, as I pointed out before. It, according to him, it's a way that lower class people are making money, are earning a living, are getting by, are getting promoted. I mean, it's, it's Me Too movement stuff in some ways, in terms of there's an abuse of power sometimes that characterizes homosexual subcultures in the first half of the 19th century, um, in that you, know, you could get a carriage ride and also negotiate a little something else on the side, which is, I mean, nothing, how does it get more modern than that kind of prostitution in a way? Um, so uh, sorry to spend so long on that question, but I think that that one I, I wanted to answer because I really hope that more work starts to happen in art history and beyond it on that specific question. Um, then someone asked the very first one was about the, this, are these, I think it was about, are these composites particular to him? Uh, and this idea of looking at men for definitions of manhood. Ooh, I like that one. Um, and I think the second half of the book, that my book is divided into three parts. I already said the first one is about Nicholas's Russia, autocratic masculinity. And the second half is about homosociality and homoeroticism. And I think that's the section where I really try to grapple with this question of how is man masculinity constituted by men negotiating other men. Uh, and that can mean both erotically, both in terms of the kind of looking that I think Ivanov is doing with his models and, and at the academy and, and it probably in his life with Gogol and beyond. Um, but it, it comes up everywhere in the book that maybe we too often depending on the discipline and the period you're studying, think of masculinity as constituted by the relationships between men and women, which it certainly is, but it's also really constituted by negotiating that and what other men think of you. And that can mean both men you have sex with and men that you are friends with or men's that you're je men that you're jealous of. It means your father, it means your priest, it means your czar. I mean, it, it, it goes in every direction. I mean, the, the, the tentacles of, of how masculinity as lived experience are constructed, at least in the way that I describe it in the book, is kind of in this kind of incredible flux uh, altogether. The other two kind of struck me as a little bit more comments. Maybe I didn't quite understand the questions. Um, someone talked about the reactions to sexuality and how we don't use these terms anymore. That's definitely true. I talk at the beginning of this chapter as every historian worth their salt does that, you know, the term homosexuality doesn't exist in this moment when, when in terms of a, a designated identity um, in the way that we use it today, it's gonna take in, in Europe, I think until 1879 when the term is first used uh, medically and maybe Roman can, can correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, and in Russia, it, it's even later that, that the term uh, comes in, in, again, in the sense of a, an identity, a designated identity that we're describing. 
So uh, whoever asked the question is right that there are all these euphemisms. I talked about uh, pederastic depravity being one way of describing this, the actual sexual act. Um, but then there are others, there's these inferences about morality. Uh, some of the things that Andre said in the letter that don't, you know, ooh, don't choose a subject that is morally depraved. That could definitely be an illusion. That kind of terminology is there. And to round it out, as in the chapter, I do talk about more of the terms for, of which there are many in Russian by this period, effeminate men. Uh, men who are actually look effeminate, there are terms for that in Russian, which Ivanov would have been aware of. Uh, there are kind of nasty euphemisms for men who act like women, uh, men who are softies or pushovers in terms of letting women push them around. Um, so I, again, point, point to the larger chapter for those who are interested in some of this terminological stuff that's going on that's influencing self-depiction and depiction of others. I see it's 202. I'm trying to like end it off. All right. Uh, I think that's all we have. Ilya, if you want to close us out. Yes, uh, with regret. I, I wish we could keep going. Uh, this was so uh, wonderful. Thank you, Alison, Molly, and everybody who asked questions and participated. And, and uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, we'll see you two weeks from now, hopefully. Uh,